And so now it's like, well, we have the authentic, we have the um, traditional, whatever you want to call it, uh, incredibly well produced, well orchestrated. So many scores coming out of like Abbey Road Studios, London Symphony, all that. But now we're looking for corruptions. We're looking for like, well, what's a score that takes, you know, maybe it has traditional instruments, maybe it has traditional whatever, but it's much more left field and they're very much valuing unique sounds combinations of styles are, are really huge right now. like I already know you a bit more like there's some folks that I never they just appear they're just random people right like composers maybe some some even were students and stuff the first thing I wanted to ask just to help frame all this is to get a sense of what your goal here is because I know the goal is to obviously be useful to you right like to just say like I, as just one random person's opinion on on this on these tracks to another how how can I slash we be most helpful to you you're in a you're in a different place most of the people who kind of you know took part in this thing they have no leg to stand on professionally yet they're really they're really at the starting gate going i don't know what to do help me kind of just have some known like some north star i can kind of look to but i feel like you're 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 not in that position so uh if it might help us if you kind of guide us uh, just to, okay. to be most useful to you, I, I think, unless you would prefer a cold read. So I feel like I'm in the position right now where I'm, I like dance along the periphery of a lot of stuff. And there are certain things that I would love to hear a perspective from people who have worked on really high level games of what you would listen for, just like putting yourself in the shoes of a music supervisor or, or and or somebody who has, you know, you've done these games. So how do you go from working on a couple of indie mobile games to getting a foot in the door? And I know demo is a part of that. So I guess it's kind of what I'm missing from the demo, what you would want to hear more. And I mean, the more nitty gritty that you can get in there, the more awesome it would be mm -hmm. like, I don't think I need to focus more on melody backgrounds is a singer. So, you know, we sing <laughs> melodies until the cows come home. So, but like, do you want to hear octatonic? Do you want to hear really weird shit coming out of all of this stuff? Like it's, I, I guess that's kind of where I am on that. A lot of my bigger credits are in film, but in, again, kind of like on the periphery, like I'm doing copyist and proofreading and all this sort of stuff and have gotten connected that way but not necessarily into film games mm -hmm. all that sort of thing so it's kind of like how do I get from where I am over here having some you know recognizable credits but getting in where I'm composer or orchestrator or conductor or whatever so I Absolutely, guess that's yeah. that's kind of where I am yeah, you know, honestly, this uh, this listen to link is like burning a hole in my monitor. I really wanted to get into it, but I I, I did want to mention that you know I'm reading your bio. Uh, I love the fact that you're working with so many uh, East Coast uh, orchestras. Like I'm from Philadelphia originally, and I remember as like a little kid, I, I actually got to that on your bottle. Oh. yeah, I got I got to uh, sing in some. I was like little kid choir. Uh, I think it was either Flummerfelt or Savalich was conducting. <gasps> Um, and yeah, like they invited our little school choir to be a part of the big, I think it was maybe Handel, you know, Messiah or something like that. Oh, but that's like so awesome. Looking at this, I'm like, whoa, this is so sick. Like, are you from it, the East Coast or? or I am. That? I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, oh, my, oh, my, awesome. I know. And my, my dad grew up in Havertown. Um, Dude, I went his, to Haverford, like the Haverford school. Serious? So I feel like I ought to just, I, I ought to just bow out of this. Uh, at this point. <laughs> I don't think you know I'm what I have to say? Uh, 
the last like seven Call of Duty games have been scored by three people who have grown up within a 10 mile radius of each other. <laughs> like me oh my gosh. And, and Jack Wall. We all grew up in like the same little area. And for some weird reason, oh, that's the last so like seven funny. or eight Call of Duties. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Yay, go Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, <laughs> apparently. So funny. That's, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm from Allentown originally, but a lot of those credits, um, it's sort of like a weird way that I got into doing any of this in the first place. I actually went into music education and taught okay. for 10 years um, choir, and I have a master's degree from Westminster Choir College, which is how I got connected wow. to Flummerfell and all of the other conductors and everything, uh, because gotcha, yeah. doing doing your master's degree, you're singing with Berlin, you're singing at Carnegie, you're singing with New York, you're singing with Philadelphia Orchestra and all that wow. sort of stuff. It was amazing. amazing. It was an amazing <laughs> experience. I ended up moving out to California and was teaching down in Manhattan Beach for a real long time at the, at the high school there and then got married and moved, started taking classes at UCLA because I also taught music theory down at Miracosta. We had like AP and loved music mm. theory the whole way through and, and loved to write but it was like you know I mean growing up in Pennsylvania there wasn't a whole lot of opportunities and didn't really think about ever really doing the orchestration thing until I got out here and then went to UCLA was taking some orchestration classes and went hmm I'm actually not to toot my own heart, but I'm like, okay, well, I'm a little better than some of the people in this class like I actually can do <laughs> music and do all this sort of stuff I'm like yeah. Hmm. Okay. This might not be a bad thing. And and fortunately, you know, being married, suddenly I had the freedom financially to even remotely explore it. And mm. um, while I was there, I reprised music services. So uh, Tim Rodier, who's doing Omni, Omni. Um, he and um, and Rob Scannell are like the two main people at reprise that used to be Universal. They came into one of the classes and said, hey, we're always looking for, oh, yeah, glory. Yeah, I, 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 all need, of, I need to order that. All of his, well, you should, all of them sell out. You should, any anytime he releases. I know, something. I need to get on it. So he and, and Rob came into one of our classes and got hooked up with them. And they said, we're always looking for interns and, you know, at the music library. And then it just went from there. In my experience, at least, and I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard it, but certainly anything analytical about my music has never been remotely related to how I got any kind of job. So I guarantee you that even if I hear some things that I'm like, oh, you know, I just for some reason really want to tell you about the way that I heard that, you know, resolution of your, of your harmonies at such and such time, that's just me being a nerd briefly. Career advice would never really come in that form because I've never gotten a job because they liked the way I resolved that cadence or <laughs> you know, or like or or anything remotely comparable to that. Obviously, relationships are paramount. So that so in a way, the nature of what you asked is kind of a separate conversation than what we're sort of anchored around here. But I I will I, I will so I just wanted to plant that seed in, in case you know, 30 minutes from now, you're not going, well, wait a minute. You know, this discussion about my music is, is not sort of directly applicable to that transition from, you know, the, the mobile game to the next Call of Duty or, or whatnot. It's a multifaceted conversation. I just wanted to shine a light on that. Um, I'm happy to get into that to the extent that we have time for. And, and again, I, I want to be deeply respectful of both your time uh, here today. But um, um, I, yeah, I, I assume you that's pretty concordant with your experience also will of, of just relationships and 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 relationships and then at some point credits plus relationship drive absolutely yeah yeah overwhelmingly beyond oh you know i i i don't even think anyone's ever hired me because they said something like oh i really loved that melody from such and such you know it was always hmm. like i my buddy so and so who runs that studio that you worked with we just got to talking about music and he said he had a nice time working with you and I thought I'd reach out and say hi and and it, and then they're like they basically will only remember oh I just I played you know Abzu and I didn't hate the music that's about all I like it's often 
<laughs> it, it often really is something as minimal as that. Every, very, you know, of course there are those cases of, oh, I heard your stuff in such and such and it's just amazing and I love it and can you work on the thing? But more often than not, that there's just so much good music in the world that it's gonna, that a far more effective filter for people looking to hire a composer is word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, plenty of exceptions to that, you know. I remember Gareth telling me about a project that he got hired on because they had basically tempt the whole game with Ori. You know, they they obviously liked Ori, so they tempt it with it, and then they were like, "You think maybe he'll just do our game?" And yeah, okay. So, so like that that's an example to the contrary of what I'm saying. But that I think it's less commonly stories like that. You sent me two pieces. It's about two minutes and change, so I'm just gonna play it. And then we'll dig into it. Well, you want to kick us yeah, off? Yeah, you know, the first thing I, I noticed, it's like, you know, really nice performance, very great dynamics. Uh, I really love the choir later on. For the mix, I would say it's a little bit on the verby and boomy side. It, I didn't, okay. uh, like there was like sort of like a presence that I was missing. And then there was a lot of the wash, um, which sounded great on the choir, but on the strings, uh, you know, sometimes you really want that kind of very aggressive attack to it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not entirely sure what I'm taking notes. Hang on. That. Oh, sorry. I'll oh, I'm just I'm taking notes. Scramble. So if you think if you see I'm just like a, you know. Oh yeah. yeah looking sure. at my phone or anything like that. I'm actually. Yeah, like so, sometimes. Uh, what I mean, depending on how much uh, detail you have in terms of like, do you have the Pro Tools mixed? Do you have stems or anything? Uh, sometimes the solution is to add close mics. Sometimes the solution is to mix in samples, um, if you want a little bit of that extra bite. And sometimes the solution is to have a soloist to overdub. I've done um, that in that extra, you know. Uh, it's such a nice sound. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Like a single violin that you track on their own and then the mm -hmm. violin section playing the same part. Uh, uh, like it's, I've, I've only recently kind of toyed around with some of that. And it was like, oh man, what a, what a nice way to be able to pull it front and back and play around with the presence of it in a yeah a very 3d kind of thing i would say that um structurally uh the the main the main comment i have is that when you're talking about a demo or a main theme or like any kind of like a this is the first thing people hear um i usually like to um 
try like in the first literally like one to three seconds have some sort of a unique sound that uh, that they maybe haven't heard before or wouldn't be expected. And about 40 seconds in, we hear this really nice melody. Um, it sounds great and it's, it's very memorable and, and tuneful, but until that point, it felt quite uh, backgroundy. Like you're expecting to hear maybe some dialogue or something. And you know, this is like leading into to that moment. Um, mm -hmm. And I always like to, to find some way to begin with an ear grabbing sound of some kind. And then at 112, you have this um, choral moment which I thought was very unique and very memorable and very ear grabbing. Um, so, I mean, I, I just kind of spitballing and obviously this is, you know, a composer talking, but I thought it might be cool if the piece could even just begin with like a preview of that moment, maybe you know, two to four bars of mm. just them singing on their own, very minimal accompaniment, maybe nothing low, but maybe like high string harmonics or something to support it and give a sense of where the harmony is. Um, but maybe just a, a few seconds of that and then launch into the driving low string. So you start off with the uniqueness, get their attention going, and then launch into the energy and the, the vibe that, that you have. Okay. But uh, yeah, cool. other than That's that, cool I, mean, I, really, I really love the piece, really good stuff. Okay. I don't have any disagreement with any of that. Um, the, I, I'm curious, is this from something? It, 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 I assume it's, part of the choices that you made were because of some contextual thing for whatever this comes from? Yes. What's the, yep. just briefly, what's the story there? Um, like, is this from a film or a game or? or? It's actually neither. Uh, I don't know. Do you guys read um, like sci-fi fantasy books? Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in free time, whatever it's free time a, we happen to have. Uh, it's been a while, <laughs> but yeah. Um, there's a guy named Brandon Sanderson who's been writing a lot of fantasy books. Um, and the group of people that I worked with got permission to base an album off of one of his starting books was called The Way of Kings. And so mm. this what actually opened the album for The Way of Kings. And it was supposed to be kind of like this throwback to 4,000 years before all the events in the book actually happened. And so it's this kind of like leading into this war and then something unusual happens and it just, the moment fades into oblivion and kind of secrecy. So mm -hmm. that's the, one of the reasons why it was structured like that is they gave me very specific instructions is that you are opening the album. So make it feel like an intro. So yeah, that's, I, that's kind of what I gathered because it, it felt paced, you know, there's, you know, this is where the, sometimes the piece, the, the criteria for delivering the job successfully are different than the criteria of how this piece will represent me later to land the next job. And, and so that's, yeah, exactly. I, I am no stranger to editing the living hell out of my pieces for demo reel purposes uh, later because I, that I realized, like for example, I agreed with this instinct that I, I really liked, it felt very musical. I'm used to, every time I've done this, I, you can, that's a, one of the big dividing lines but amongst composers that, that comes up a lot is someone who's just, they live in sample land and they're just so used to everything being only what they program and therefore nothing that they won't program. And they, they forget, like what it's like when a group of musicians get together and, and play. And so the first thing that grabbed me was this, the way it's, you know, yeah. and I was like, oh, wow, dynamics, exciting. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't take that for granted. And uh, so I, I liked that, but I also thought I only need a taste of that to get me through it. And, and now adding and adding to the point that I love Will's point about, let give us some, some sandy secret sauce out of the gate. That's like a thing that's, you know, like, like his his sort of aleatoric trumpets in Call of Duty are a magnificent example of what's this, what's this sort of thing that's novel to kind of be the hook in the lip that drags us in for whatever ride we're off to go. I wouldn't be opposed to there being something out of the gate like he suggested, but then 
I quite like the very classy way that you introduced those low strings. I just needed one instance of it for, for demo purposes. Like again, sitting gotcha. down to listen to a whole length album, you know, Mahler, the first movement of a Mahler symphony really takes its time to establish where we are, right? That felt like what you were doing here, contextual to what is happening, well done. But if you are submitting this to land a job, they would have likely never made it to any of your exciting shit because you you, you made them wait too long. So I'm- I wondered I'm about that, okay. Yeah, I constantly mercilessly cut my stuff down. And, and the other thing is just realizing that so often we, we put all this work into like some little detail and we think, oh, therefore it's exciting because it took us a long time to, to get it right to our satisfaction, not aware that to the average listener, they don't care. And so it's perfectly okay to cut that. The piece is probably not ruined. The piece, the, the, the way you voice the violas in bar seven is not likely the why you'll get the job. So like, if you have to just cut past that to the thing that's really loud and neon sign-esque about the writing, that's what you wanna hurry up and get to. Just again, separating, okay. separating compositional integrity from presentation to just wow someone as fast and as effectively as possible. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Is that, is that, uh, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah. It's a thing that I'm still learning to be honest, like, cause I get asked to submit reels all the time and I, I have to like listen fresh to old music of mine and I'll realize, Oh, I think, I think this is like, this is boring until 30 seconds in. And so I'll just go hunting for my pro tool session or whatever and start hacking at it. Uh, uh, just, even, even if it's a thing I've submitted on reels a hundred times before, I just sometimes, my, my, my perspective on this evolves all the time. And I think it's, it's too long winded in its beginnings now, or, or this is no long, I don't even think this is an interesting, in the context of a demo reel, this is not an interesting piece anymore. And I just won't send something that a year before I may have sent. So it's always helpful gotcha. to play these for other people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to that end. Uh, any other thoughts, uh, Sir Sir Roger? No, I mean, really, really nice piece. Is, is there another one or? Yep, yep, I got another shorter one here. Uh, and uh, here it comes. definitely have a melodic sense <laughs> that's that 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 it's it's really it's not it's not common a lot of people think they can write mm -hmm. decent melodies and and then you hear it and you're like i've heard basically heard that melody before because there's a lot of tropes that people fall into um and uh but i i, I this is just classy um uh 
Will, I, 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 that was not meant to be kicking it off. I'm, I'm happy to let uh, you you uh, lead the charge here again, if you're if you're so inclined. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, it's a very, very nice melody. I love your sense of rhythm, actually. And like, you know, it's very cantabile, very well developed, I thought, um, especially, you know, how you have it recapitulating and, you, you know, it's got a very nice orchestration to it. Um, I have a similar note to before about the intro. Um, in this case, it's not really that big of a deal because uh, it, it kind of really does get right into the melody. It's just like you, you sort of need that bit of context, uh, which you, you did very eloquently. Um, this is more like, uh, it sort of leads into my second point, but this is more like, you know, having something at the very start could help. It's, it's not necessarily like um, a requirement necessarily. It's just sort of like, if you want to let people know like, hey, this is something special, take a listen. Um, I, I feel kind of, uh, kind of lame like using my own music as an example, but this kind of reminded me a little bit of my theme to Lara Croft, where at the very beginning of the track, literally at like zero, 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 I have, <laughs> I think some harp thing mixed with triangle, mixed with crotales, mixed with who the hell knows what else. And then it's just like, <laughs> just to like, kind of like, okay, wake up, music is starting. And then it launches gotcha. into a, a melodic thing. Um, uh, and, and it has its sort of um, uh, mood establishing harmonies and whatnot. But uh, the other note that I had was that, you know, this, this obviously is a, is a fantastic orchestration, but I thought it might be cool to have some kind of an outside instrument, uh, especially at the start to kind of establish it again as being something unique. Like, uh, idea, random ideas I jotted down were like, you know, guitar or mandolin to kind of double with the harmonies and give it some sort of, uh, like it, to me, it feels very medieval and very fantasy and anything else that can kind of convey that. Um, mm -hmm. I thought might might just be kind of cool to just give an extra perspective and uh, add to that sort of uniqueness. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's funny that you, you, you said, uh, so very precisely the the same thought I had it's so, so funny about like your 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 um your Osiris uh example is is a is an apt one um of of like some little announcement I actually pulled up a cue this is one of those things that Jerry Goldsmith was so incredibly good at is he 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 always he always seemed to have three main ingredients to his scores he had a theme um, he had like some smaller version of the theme that was almost more like a riff that he could kind of just dot throughout the landscape of the score to kind of always remind you it's not any movie, it's this movie. And then there was also usually this like even more boiled down kind of orchestrational gesture that's not even really a riff that just was there. Again, he would he would come up with something that's this score's thing, you know, like like. You know, I mean, every score has them. I, I pulled up an example uh, because it's all traditional orchestration. It's not even relying on going that extra mile like Will was just saying of, you know, okay, what if we then add mandolin or we add something that's maybe slightly more novel. But he did this TV movie. Uh, it, I just recently recorded a podcast about this. So it's fresh in my mind, uh, but it's so damn good. He did a, he did a, a TV movie, a TV miniseries in the eighties called Masada. And you'll see, he's got this great big, you know, like like anthemic big trumpet line, but you'll hear all the strings and winds do this brap right off the, off the line that just catapults you into what is otherwise essentially a straightforward trumpet fanfare. Listen to this. It's just such a, it's just such a pronounced gesture that is a really great way to make something memorable and you don't even have to do very much, uh, you know. It, it, it's just, yeah, little, a little flourish, a little something. Uh, it can go, can go a long way. Um, but um, uh, was there something else? I, I haven't, for some reason in my mind, you were about to say something else. So, Will, was am I, am I cutting in? Um, I had one other note, but uh, you can go ahead and ignore this if you like. 
but uh, the only note I had was- Not the first one though, you must acknowledge the first one. <laughs> well, so, the, okay. and I literally wrote down like, okay, nerd composer thought. Um, I thought it might have been even more memorable and satisfying, the, the melody itself, is in one of the uh, recapitulations of it, you actually changed key, like you had some kind of a modulation so that it really kind of solidifies the melody in people's minds. Um, mm -hmm. Again, that, you know, that's, that's it's not bad. just a, a thought if, if you're continuing the piece or, or whatever, but um, it's just, it's just something that I've, I've found is, is often quite effective. Um, but it's, okay. it's quite, Good. quite low priority. I think, I think yeah, along a similar line, the only other kind of major, not, not, not major, but, but the, the most pronounced thought that I had listening to it was you clearly have a real confidence with the traditional roles of the members of the orchestra, which I think is partly where Will's note is coming from of like, what if there's mandolin or what if there's some other thing? Just because in a way it's like, you've got all these day player actors doing the thing they always get cast for and they really excel in those roles. But we've also heard, um, like I've never heard this exact combination of that melody with this rhythm and that harmonic vocabulary, like the down to the very precise details, like literally note by note, I've not heard it obviously, but the broad concept of this type of sort of lyrical, very, you know, capital R romantic use of the orchestra, that's, that I have heard innumerable times. So my, my feedback was, would be, and it's a cousin of, of Will's note, uh, but it's, again, not knowing what the parameters of this, like if this is from that same project or it's something else and, and just bearing in mind that it's, it's always, yeah, fair enough. It, it's always a little bit, it always feels a little funny to say what you should have done when it may have been a thing that passed with flying I don't colors. Like it's yeah. all good. <laughs> just, it, it's, it's just, it's just like, bear, it's just, yeah, it's food for thought is really what it is. Uh, that the, um, using the members of the orchestra in ways that that pushes beyond what you might otherwise, you know, hear from them all the time. Like I love doing things where, you know, you, you, you introduce, like you have this English horn, very beautifully states this very lyrical kind of statement. And, and then, you know, why not clear out the middle and let the viola suddenly take over and then the cellos come in above them and then you know it's a, i'm always looking for ways to say okay cellos know what it's like to down low be going <laughs> you know and it's like what if i have the violas doing that and the cellos are up here going you know what i mean like not just that but the orchestras will always thank you that everybody loves when they're kind of like yanked out of their lane and mm. doing things that that are that are more fun to play than like the standard formulation of, of what they do you know because the thing is it's a it's a fine line because there is also one of the reasons why i love james horner and i kind of like every year i sort of love him more because he sounds more and more novel to me as we move farther and farther away from this very old soul very old-fashioned ultra traditional use of the orchestra it's it, you know we just that's just becoming increasingly a thing of the past and and and, and not in a bad way like art evolves that's exciting I, god knows i write like that very rarely because i i i like coming up with weird combinations and strange palettes and all that kind of thing but i do love Sometimes it'll just put on like Land Before Time and it'll just blast it at full volume because hearing everyone in the orchestra play beautiful writing and they're very much sticking in their lanes. I hear it and I go, oh, that's just so elegant and so classy. But it can become a very fine line between that's so classy and that's kind of hackneyed because I've heard this a million times. I'm not saying mm -hmm. your piece, your piece is far closer to the elegant end of the spectrum to my taste nice of you to say but but it well it, it just it's i mean it, it's 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 entirely possible i have poor taste but in, to my taste it's quite elegant uh thank you i, I read but. it as um i i read it though as reasonably safe it's elegant but mm -hmm. you didn't do anything that made you wonder i don't know if the musicians are going to give me a crooked eyebrow in response to this like 
I always try to find something in there that makes them, when, when, when you put out the parts before the session, I'm always looking out to see if who's at their thing and then they're going, flipping through it and they go, and you see them put on their glasses and they grab their pencil and they're like, <laughs> that's gonna be an issue. And hopefully it's not because it's poorly written, it's because they're going, ooh, that's, I'm, I'm getting out of my lane a little bit right here. And, and that, that I wanna make sure I got my eyes open when that moment comes, that sort of thing. And so I would encourage you to find those opportunities because the piece for its many merits does play it pretty safely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, I think in some ways that comes from my background as a, as a soprano, where it's like, hmm. we have the melody almost all the time. And it's just, and a lot of choral music, it's, I mean, not all, choral music, obviously. I mean, you get into 20th century and things start getting a little way out there, but most of the stuff that you sing a lot of the time is very in traditional lanes. And that's, since that has been my background, it's one of the hardest things for me is to get out past what I'm comfortable with and what I know. There's an easy, there's an easy, uh, process for remedying that write your piece it, like it's if presumably you're writing in some kind of sequencer uh mm -hmm. write your piece mute your melody channel and hit play and see if it holds your interest if the piece is still interesting mm -hmm. with the top with your with your soprano removed mm -hmm. then the musicians and future listeners and etc would potentially likely agree you know for me the goal, like this is why Bach and, and all the contrapuntalists have always been my favorite throughout history from Bach to Bartok, Brahms, you know, I'm always far more interested in them because it's like you strip away everything down to just what the altos are doing or just what the third bassoon is doing. And it's almost a self-contained piece even within the fabric of this. Th I mean, hell, I mean, you know, I probably only need to play this for a choral singer. Free, do you know what piece that is? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Morton Lordson was one of my private then, teachers yay. and he oh. um, he one of the things he told me was always always oh, that piece what is the, one of the first things is you know the the old monument mm -hmm. yeah, it's like he, he goes always keep the altos and tenors close to your heart like he he, it, he has a lot of material the primary material is held by them in that piece um, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a powerful it was a powerful kind of confirmation of where I think my heart was already Tilted towards. So it's, it's just as a technique that that you find. For me, it's always while I'm mixing. It, while I'm mixing, if I'm just focusing on like the cellos and basses, and it feels like I'm mixing a finished piece, in a way I consider that to be a good thing. Because then I realize I start adding on the rest and I go, oh, this is a piece that's hopefully many layers of individually interesting things comprising a whole. Now you have to be careful because it's really easy to write the living hell out over. of like you just yeah, yeah it's so overwrought that that it's like jesus i don't even i can't even focus it's just a wall of complexity that's not the goal it's just that there's integrity right. there's intrinsic integrity even to the baseline you know what i mean yeah yep so again there's not yeah, like it's not like there's poor craftsmanship at all it's just traditional craftsmanship and i would love to exactly. feel you I would love to feel you not sure if this is going to turn out well or not. Whereas I can't imagine finishing a piece like this and not knowing it's going to work because it, it you know, you're exactly. playing to the strengths. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So yeah. That's always been kind of my, the, the hardest part for me of just kind of like pushing the boundaries of what I can feel is right. And when it's like everything that I had known up until I really started, you know, getting in more into orchestration and writing and everything is just do, 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 little box. And so I just, any suggestions you have of getting beyond that? I am all yours. Oh. So yeah. So is, is there a, th a third piece or is this a no, good that, time to discuss like a yeah, more that, broad topic? Go for it. Yeah. So like at the very beginning, you mentioned um, going from, scoring mobile titles to scoring like more high profile console titles. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, a, a bit of a theory on on all of that. Um, and as a theory, it's it's like welcome to be wrong, which is like fine. So but this subject is to peer review. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's but this is sort of my um, my take on it. I think every console generation, you know, we're talking PlayStation one, two, three, four, five, they all have a sound and it's constantly evolving. I think that in the PlayStation, um, 
you know, two eras when we first started to have the concept of like, hey, you can have an orchestra playing your game score and it'll be played back in real time in the game, you know, not, not as some separate album, but like in the game, live orchestra, mind blowing. And then PlayStation 3 happened and they said, well, you know, now that we're the you know, cigar chomping music directors, we can hire <laughs> anyone. So let's get Danny Elfman to do the main theme. Let's hire these Hollywood, you know, whatever. And so it went from like, okay, we're reveling in our new technical um, uh, abilities to, okay, now we're focusing on authenticity. Uh, if we want a Hollywood score, let's get a big name Hollywood composer to the score. And, and that was a lot of what was happening in the PlayStation 3 era. Um, but PlayStation 4 and 5, I think things are, are switching up a little bit in an interesting way. And now we've had authenticity up the yin yang. Everyone in Hollywood who's a big name has done a game score at this point, pretty much. Um, and so now it's like, well, we have the authentic, we have the um, traditional, whatever you want to call it, uh, incredibly well produced, well orchestrated. So many scores coming out of like Abbey Road Studios, London Symphony, all that. But now we're looking for corruptions. We're looking for like, well, what's a score that takes you know, maybe it has traditional instruments, maybe it has traditional whatever, but it's much more left field and they're very much valuing unique sounds. Combinations of styles are, are really huge right now. Like you look at a score like Spider-Man Miles Morales, for example, and that's mm -hmm. a score where they took the sound of the orchestra, very, very well orchestrated. And then they took the sound of hip hop and trap music. And then they just jammed them together and said, well, what happens? Or even Assassin's Creed, where they said, like, we don't even care about sounding epic anymore. Let's just have a bunch of really interesting instruments, Nordic instruments, um, and a little bit of synthesis and sound design or whatever. And let's just see what, what happens. And we care more about um, fitting the scene in terms of the setting and the vibe than necessarily having, like, the perfect epic energy that you would normally expect from a game score. Um, De Death Stranding is another example where they said like, well, let's just kind of invent our own genres of music that would make sense in a gray apocalypse. What would people be listening to? And they're asking those kinds of questions and uh, musical sound design is becoming more important than ever. I think that's kind of where things are going to go in the PlayStation 5 era. I think that Hildur Gutnadotter is one of the greatest composers to, to listen to right now. Um, and of course, uh, Johan Johansson. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. because they're doing a lot with musical sound design and smaller ensembles and focusing on very soloistic performances. And I think that that kind of pairing down, and also Austin, I have to mention your Assassin's Creed, um, the, the <laughs> London one, I, I forget which I name I love that, was, yeah. But, Syndicate. You know, it's very solo Syndicate, yeah. yes, thank you. Um, very soloistic, very pared down. I think that's the direction um, that we're going in. And I won't bore you with details, but there are reasons for all of these direction shifts. And the reason that we're going into this direction with pared down um, instrumentation and lots more sound design, musical sound design and synthesis is because of um, the way that game companies are mixing games nowadays. Uh, the style of mixing is very different than it was back in the PS3 era. And we're even in the sound design, they're focusing on like little, little tiny details. Like you listen to a shooter now versus a shooter from say 10 years ago. Back then it was cacophonic sounds all over the place. It's crazy. But now it's like, okay, okay. We have great, um, excuse me, losing my voice, audio budgets. And we're recording everything anew. You know, everything has uh, their own um, recording sessions for all the guns. There's like no library stuff is being used at all. And the mix techniques, that it's it's all tech crap but like they're doing a lot of things to make sure that you're hearing every last detail of this sword swing or this gun in real time with dynamic mix like they took like the greatest film mix engineers and then just shoved them into the playstation and it's a dynamic mix now and when you have these larger than life orchestrations um they're they're cool but it doesn't really fit with that vibe nearly as much as it did back in like the PS3 era. Um, and, and PS5, of course, Sony is, is investing so much money into their um, audio technology now that I, I can only assume that the idea of the very customized and uh, bespoke ensemble is just gonna be more and more important um, to learn how to write in. Uh, so, I mean, this honestly is just kind of like a much more dire <laughs> version of what Austin was saying about like, 
the you know the the unique ensemble is is being much more valued nowadays than something that sounds traditional or or typical. Mm -hmm. Look at the um, gotcha. Look at the what are you know from 2020? What are the most acclaimed scores? You've got Last of Us Part Two, which is basically a guy in a room playing a variety of instruments that you know in a very intimate and personal way. You've got Ghost of Tsushima, which is a very deep dive into how to authentically fuse you know traditional Western orchestra with with a really deeply knowledgeable understanding of of uh, Japanese not just instruments, but specific traditions. Um, mm -hmm. Doom Eternal, which is, you know, just the most full on satanic metal that that one could possibly <laughs> imagine. You know, Darren's uh, Hades, the sort of crazy Greek rock thing. I don't even know what genre you call that. Sort of like <laughs> Greek, Greek prog, ancient Greek prog rock. Um, and, um, and you've got uh, like the, the the one kind of outlier, the Final Fantasy VII remake is kind of one of the few outliers of pretty pretty traditional use of the orchestra. Like, and even then, the JRPG tradition for the use of the orchestra is pretty instantly different from like the German composers of the eight, uh, the eighteen hundreds. So even then, our definition of traditional has like the asterisks of traditional to JRPGs, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's like, so there's, there's no, there's no like John Williams or James Horner sound alikes really to be found in the, what are the most acclaimed scores that are getting, you know, a lot of attention. Look at, look at uh, the Mortal Kombat music, another excellent example of like the orchestra is there to my mind to, uh, don't let me speak for you, but, but the orchestra is there adding muscle behind a lot of really interesting soloists up front more than anything. To me, they feel like an amplifier more than the, <laughs> the, 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 the spear point, you know, like I'm, I'm hearing Doug Perry more than I'm hearing the whole rest of the orchestra in many <laughs> cases. And it, it seems very deliberate, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's, I think, and, and for all we know, five years from now, everything will have swung back around because we've gone on such this deep dive. Everyone's like, boy, I just really want to hear violins and flutes and, and cellos and like it could be that the, the 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 ebb and flow of taste i mean look at hollywood you know in the 40s and 50s it was very traditional use of the orchestra then jazz started to make a bigger and bigger impression then in the 60s and 70s you had this wild period of experimentation where every score was just crazy and you you had the bernard hermans in one side and you had the jerry goldsmiths and the lalo schifrins and the john berries and there was just this explosion and then john williams comes along and it's like ah, and does star wars and then <laughs> All the 80s is this like, there's like this parallel lanes through the 80s of the synth wave world, you know, as, as all the modular synths mm -hmm. took over everything. And you had like your Tangerine Dreams and your Vangelis's who are, who are making giant impressions. But then on the back of John Williams, just massive success. You've got him and Bruce Broughton and, and Jerry Goldsmith and James Horner appears on the scene at that time doing like the most traditional orchestra imaginable. And then of course, Hans Zimmer shows up not long after that changes everything all over again. So it's like everything seems to have these kind of periods where there's a zeitgeisty central rallying cry. And I think everything I, I, you're one person doesn't Keep count shifting. as peer review, but I, I think, I think your assessment will of like the kind of what's driving these ebbs and flows is, is a pretty savvy one. I hadn't actually thought about mixing techniques on the game side as being one of the core components, but it makes total sense even just as someone whose career is- Yeah, well, just a little background. The reason why I think it is, is because if you look at who is driving the audio department, it's going to be the audio leads who are usually coming from sound design and usually they're the mm -hmm. ones mixing it. And so they're also making the decisions of whom to hire as the composer. And so that's kind of how, that, like now that um, the technology is no longer necessarily a bottleneck, that's kind of what's what's been driving the force. Cause like everything up until PlayStation 2, I would argue the technology kind of drove how the music sounded. Um, totally. And so it's just gotten a little bit more political and more interesting since then is that, you know, okay, now it's like, well, it's the personalities involved. It went from composer, like in the, in the old days, composers were usually the audio leads or direct whatever you want to say but now it's usually the sound designers um which also kind of leads to another point that i wanted to make about the um the networking side of getting into um into the big 
titles or, or whatever. Um, and I'll just spill the beans on literally how I've gotten every gig I've gotten for the last five years. What I tend to do is like, when, when I'm looking for the next thing, um, first off, I, I don't do that like when I'm without work, like you're always trying to overlap a little bit, you know, like, you know, think ahead. But I have my whole PlayStation game collection and I just take all the games out and just put them all on the floor. And then I start organizing them and I say like, okay, well, typically games take about three years to make these days, give or take. And again, typically it, it always depends, but usually it's like maybe in the last year and a half, maybe year, that's when they're looking for a composer for their new title. So I'd look at the release dates of all these games and I kind of sort them based on that. And I say like, okay, these people are probably not working on the next thing just yet, or these people, you know, whatever. Um, or maybe this is like, it's too late. I shouldn't bother trying to talk to them. They're obviously uh, too well off or if they had an announcement, whatever. And then with the pile that I have left, I say, well, what are the titles that I personally think had stellar sound design? that I really thought that the sound sound effects in particular were and the mix and whatnot were really, really good and something that I really appreciate. And then I have this pile and then I start thinking, okay, well, who do I know? Uh, you know, I maybe I'm in the minority, but I, I love LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is a fantastic resource mm -hmm. for not just finding out like who's the audio director at this company or whatever, but like, okay, well, who do they know that I also know? And I've I've been able to my own network of, of previous collaborators at like LucasArts or Sledgehammer or wherever, um, I would be able to say, hey, uh, could you introduce me to whomever at the, you know, uh, the audio director of this company um, over email? And then maybe at GDC, uh, we, can, we can meet or hang out or whatever. Uh, and that's, that's literally how I got on with the Call of Duty. That's how I got in with Mortal Kombat. Um, Guild Wars and Destiny, it was more like, you know, we're, we're up here in Seattle and we would just meet in different meetups and stuff and kind of got to talking and then that led to whatever. Um, and then by now, I mean, I, I don't really actively, this is going to sound so privileged, but like, I don't really actively look for work at the moment uh, because, you know, since I had all of those connections that were real connections, mm -hmm. like actual friendships, people I talk to like all the time and eventually they're in a position where they're hiring and it's like, well, I could hire, you know, I could go off and do these like elaborate demoing, whatever, or I could just go and talk to Will. Um, and that's, that's kind of the business side of, of how I've structured that transition. Um, and, 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 and apologies for monologuing, but there's one last thing I, I wanted to mention about mobile. You're not monologuing. It's good info. Like <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, what I will say is that mobile titles have not been, um, following the same sort of uh, trend stepping that console titles have. And in fact, if you look at uh, East Asian mobile titles in particular, uh, you can kind of see this very accurately. Like, it's almost like they're frozen in the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3 a little bit <laughs> era, where mm -hmm. they don't necessarily care about being super trendy and, um, you know, very, uh, like, you know, they're not trying to like follow lockstep with Hollywood or anything like that. They're just saying, well, mm -hmm. you know, have a broader perspective of the game as a whole. You know, the camera is usually much further out in a mobile title than a console title. If you think about like the types mm -hmm. of game genres. And I think because mm -hmm. of that, um, you're more so being asked to write a, a picture of the world as a whole, rather than like, this is the unique character's experience. That's and I really, think that character yeah. experience is why we've gravitated towards the solo instruments, the unique instrumentation, uh, the synthesis, the, you know, more bespoke ensembles. Whereas if you're taking this broader picture, then it's, it's totally okay to have the traditional orchestrations and the throwback kinds of, kinds of scores. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's just sort of my theory on, on how mobile scoring is a little bit different um, from, from the console scoring. Like it, it would be a little tricky to imagine like a Last of Us 2 mobile score sounding like that, if you know what I mean. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just sort of my, my two cents on, on It's that. an interesting take. I, I, it's really good, yeah. I, I, um, I, I think there's probably some merit to that. I, I'm usually the guy that if, if I'm told, look, because it's X, we want to do Y, like because it's, you know, a, a, a 
pushed back camera in a big spacious breath of the wildy open world. We want to do something, uh, you know, like Genshin, you know, like super lush traditional orchestra or something mm. like that. Um, and I, I would, I would be the guy to say, what if we tried the solo electric yeah. bass just to see, and you know, I've started many projects where we then do that. And we're like, yeah, there's a reason why they like orchestra on these. <laughs> and, but then there's been other times where it, it actually paid dividends. And we, if at minimum, we learned something that we found a use for somewhere. Um, but I think Which, that's a pretty way, plausible. I, that is a fantastic yeah. way to honestly start every project is to challenge the assumptions and see where the boundaries are and all that. Um, mm -hmm. But I will, I will counter by saying that that kind of thinking is perfect for a console title. Whereas on a mobile title where the screen is only like this big and you're like, <laughs> look at it from this far away. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's sort of, I, I guess that's what I meant by like the camera is far away. It's like, you don't get that like personal detail that you have in a console title with the mix the being the, the, the style that it is. Um, but anyway, that, I, I, I mean, also, that I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Good. I, I think that, I think that it, you could, I could kind of potentially if I was an audio director, I could potentially counter, uh, like quasi counter from the angle of so many mobile games are also trying to assert that they can hold their own to the traditional consoles. So they may want to go big lush, not because of perspective, but as a way of sort of declaring their, their equality as it were, uh, mm. you know, like just because we're on a screen this big, through a little mono speaker on the bottom doesn't mean we don't care about production. I, I could see the argument coming from that direction. I've certainly yeah. had meetings that had tinges of that where they're, they really- and, and you've, you've worked with uh, Tencent as well, right? And Yeah, and they, yeah, they that's kind of- <laughs> Yeah, and they have incredible music budgets. Um, I mean, on, on, this, is sort of, this, this discussion came up at, at some point earlier for a, a different like podcast or something, but like, someone mentioned like, oh, why do you want to work on these mobile titles? Like, why did you do that call? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Millions of people are playing right. these. They have fantastic music budgets. They really care about music. Um, why not? And so I think the, the concept of like mobile being anything less than console is, is, is quite outdated. I mean, I mean, for, yeah, as a point of reference on that, doing that PUBG mobile thing uh, uh, yeah, yeah. over the summer, uh, so that was all full traditional orchestra with a few little novelties tossed in um, that we recorded remote to Vienna. I guess I guess the same as you did. Yeah. Uh, and um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember my my friend I worked on the project with goes um, he goes I don't want to uh, make you feel I don't remember how you phrase it like feel weird or in, you know sad or something. But he goes. Uh, Given the the uh, install base for Game for Peace and PUBG Mobile uh, have of like minimum 50 million daily users, he goes, I think more people heard the score that just got added to the game that you wrote than lifetime journey music, like to date. In the in the first in the first the first 24 hours of this game, more people heard your music than in the last nine years of Journey being released. And I'm sure that's correct. Like, I mean, you just can't compete with those numbers. A free to play mobile game, especially one that's a hit in China is like- yeah, International. Yeah. yeah, you'll have you'll have more people hearing your music than exist in other than certain countries, uh, you know, just like immediately. So yeah, I think the mobile world has clearly, you know, reached a new, it's interesting because it represents the, the extreme range of possibilities because you have the absolute no budget made by a person at home through to you know these just ridiculously indulgent I mean like I did that PUBG thing with Brian Tyler I assure you he did not charge yeah. them a low amount of money uh like <laughs> that 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 um they so it's just, there's this crazy spectrum um and the audience mm -hmm. is likewise mm -hmm. absolutely yeah yeah any other last uh, thoughts or thanks for sharing this stuff with us? It really is very nice writing. It's very refreshing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing all of their tidbits and professional opinions and everything to just, that's what these things are for. And it's really, really helpful. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Yeah. I, I, I love hearing people who've come from like the classical world. 
and they sort of bring that <laughs> perspective. You know, it, if, there, if there's any one last thing that I want to say, it's that, you know, that is a unique feature of, of your background, um, especially if you've studied like the more modern, like 20th century classical, you know, art music type stuff that doesn't mm. really get a lot of, um, you, you don't really see too many composers who are particularly fluent in that uh, anymore. Uh, no, look at uh, the the newest score that Mikolai and Gary Scheiman tag teamed. Yeah. Uh, Metamorphosis, Metamorphosis, yep. Yeah. It's a good yeah. example. It stood out because of how oh, authentically like, expressionist. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. And so that's, I mean, if, if it's something that you're interested in, then anything you can do to leverage your old experiences um, before being, in, you know, focused on the composition, uh, I think that'll pay, pay back in dividends. Absolutely. Nice. Okay. Couldn't agree Thank more. Thank you. Appreciate it.